There is no theory. You only have to listen. Pleasure is the law. I love music passionately, and because I love it, I try to free it from barren traditions that stifle it. It is a free art, gushing forth, an open-air art, boundless as the elements, the wind, the sky, the sea. It must never be shut in and become an academic art. When the prodigiously talented 10-year-old Claude Debussy entered the Paris Conservatory in 1872, the German dominance of European art music established by Beethoven at the beginning of the century showed no signs of abating. The influence of Wagner's revolutionary music and aesthetics was pervasive, and even those musicians who lacked an affinity for his work were forced to confront the cultural implications of his art. While Debussy was initially fascinated by the German master's advanced harmonic language, his ability to create striking orchestral effects, and the breadth of his artistic vision, he would come to view Wagner's musical pursuit of metaphysics as a dead end. This developing aversion also had a cultural dimension. After decades as continental Europe's most formidable military power, France's humiliating defeat in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 had resulted in the loss of the northeastern territory of Alsace-Lorraine and a war indemnity of billions. Germany, now unified for the first time in its history, became Europe's dominant military force. The enmity between the two countries fueled a spirit of nationalism in France that appealed to Debussy motivating his search for a new, distinctively French style that was free from Germanic influences. Although Germany's preeminence in the musical realm had inhibited the development of French music, the traditional strength of the visual arts in France became an important source of inspiration for Debussy. In the 1860s, a group of artists that included Claude Monet, Auguste Renoir, and Edgar Degas began to experiment with a style of painting that eschewed the clear lines and contours of conventional representational art in favor of a more suggestive approach that emphasized overall visual effects, mixed and unmixed colors, broken brush strokes, and subtle renderings of varying shades of light. Although this new aesthetic was derisively labeled Impressionism to mock its lack of depictive clarity, the term was soon embraced by both the public and the artists themselves. The new style was an effective response to the advent of photography, which had preempted the documentary imperative that had always been attached to visual art. Impressionist paintings exploited the medium's infinite possibilities for color and shading to render the artist's subjective visions and evoke essential aspects of nature. This approach was extremely attractive to Debussy, and he began to develop an analogous musical language that would form the basis for his own characteristic style. Through his use of ambiguous tonalities, extended harmonies, and carefully calibrated textures, he established a form of musical impressionism, a term he variously loathed and accepted, that explicitly rejected the grandiosity of late 19th century German music and its aspirations towards extra-musical meaning. In this regard, French symbolist poetry, which emphasized the sounds and the associations attached to words over their literal meaning, stimulated a further clarification of his creative vision. When one of his favorite symbolist poets, Stéphane Mallarmé, declared, to name an object is to destroy its poetic enjoyment, the aim is to suggest it, he was articulating a sensibility that would become a fundamental tenet of Debussy's artistic creed. Debussy's defiantly patient compositional process is exemplified by the long period of gestation required to produce his three nocturnes. The work was initially conceived in 1892 as an orchestral triptych after the poem Scenes at Twilight by the symbolist Henri de Renier, but within two years he was writing to the Belgian violinist Eugene Isai about three nocturnes for solo violin and orchestra. Since nothing remains of these pieces, their connection to the work Debussy ultimately completed in 1899 rests primarily on anecdotal information. A more definitive source of inspiration was a series of paintings entitled Nocturnes by the American Impressionist James Whistler. 
Using soft, diffused light, muted tones, and hazy outlines, Whistler imbued these pieces with a strong sense of mood, and these techniques would find their parallels in the restricted dynamic compass, undirected, non-progressive harmony, and exquisitely crafted orchestration that make Debussy's nocturnes so evocative. The vivid, compelling nature of this music may lead one to consider that while Schoenberg was seeking to sustain what he called the supremacy of German music by advancing a revolutionary, highly intellectualized musical aesthetic, Debussy was creating a musical language that would arguably have a greater influence on a broader range of the 20th century's most important composers, including Stravinsky, Bartok, Prokofiev, von Williams, Copland, and Boulez. The essence of this much quieter revolution was aptly identified by the critic Pierre de Breville in an assessment of the Nocturnes after their premiere in October of 1901. Debussy's great achievement arises from not demanding of music all that she can give, but instead asking from her what she alone is capable of suggesting. 